90 miles across the Mediterranean from North Africa, fortified Italian islands are first to feel the power of Allied bombs as invasion of the continent begins. Bombers of the United States Air Force lead the way. Their objective, Pantelleria, halfway between Cape Bon and Sicily. A vital Axis base, Pantelleria has been a constant threat to United Nations shipping in the Mediterranean. Now, after 18 days of continuous pounding, the island stronghold crumbles beneath the attack. Air drones and defenses are left in smoking ruins. One after another, vital stepping stones to the continent fall to Allied hands. This is only the beginning. At an airport in Algeria, General Charles de Gaulle and General Henri Giraud meet for the first time since the historic conference at Casablanca. Together, they inspect the army of reborn France, an army rapidly being equipped with new and modern weapons from America, an army nearly half a million strong, ready to fight with the Allies against the Axis. service to France, General Giraud awards the Allied Supreme Commander, General Eisenhower, the highest decoration France can bestow, Grand Cross of the Legion of Honor. It is General Giraud's own insignia, won on the field of battle. General Eisenhower said, as you wear no decoration, I shall follow your example and treasure this unworn until France is liberated. Planting 20% more potatoes this year than last, farmers in one American state seek to beat their 1942 crop record, 42 million bushels. Using planting machines, these modern tillers of the soil believe in mass production. The job doesn't stop with nightfall. American farmers are working overtime to produce the food to win the war. The massive gates of the Temple of Minakshi, a monument to Oriental architecture, hallowed shrine to India's 250 million Hindus. Thousands of pilgrims gather for the traditional four-day festival to the gods of the temple. In huge wooden carts, drawn by the devout, the religious figures are borne through the crowded streets in solemn procession. A ceremony as ancient and colorful as Mother India herself. Constructing an oil pipeline from the Midwest to eastern points in the United States, engineers are forced to cross many a mighty river. Big Inch, as the line is called, now has another waterway to hurdle. So they plant tons of dynamite to blast a bed for the pipe beneath the river's bottom. Hold tight and watch for the explosion. At 
Washington Navy Yard, fighting Greeks salute President Roosevelt as he comes to present the Royal Hellenic Navy with a new warship. A guard of honor sees the stars and stripes replaced by the national flag of unconquered Greece, staunch ally of the United Nations. Greek sailors man the ship, men who remember the invasion of their country, now given a weapon with which to fight that Greece shall be made free. Another giant new factory to produce synthetic rubber begins to operate somewhere in the United States. Here, butadiene, derived from alcohol and stored in these huge tanks, is converted into synthetic rubber. Springing up virtually overnight, the mechanical city employs thousands of workers and is prepared to turn out 90,000 tons of rubber a year. Not only is the manufacture of this man-made rubber one of the amazing scientific triumphs of our time, the synthetic product is superior to anything heretofore achieved. When vital sources of crude rubber were cut off because of the war, science and industry combined and solved the problem. Here's a sample 75-pound cake, one plant capable of producing rubber for 16 million tires a year. Twenty-two hundred women of the United States Naval Forces salute the First Lady of China, Madame Chiang Kai-shek. These are but a part of the nation's rapidly growing army of women volunteers. Women serving in the Marine Corps, the Coast Guard, the Navy. Women stationed at bases in the United States, doing jobs that release more fighting men for combat duty overseas. In America, as in all the United Nations, women are mobilized for total war. Revolution flares in the Argentine. Moving into Buenos Aires at dawn, army units take over government buildings in a dramatic move against the nation's president, Castillo. Castillo, unpopular with many because of his pro-Axis sentiments, is forced to resign. Artillery commands strategic points throughout the capital, third largest city in the Western Hemisphere as the military wins control. Most serious violence occurred at the Navy School for Mechanics during a 45-minute machine gun battle. In the general confusion and rioting, 40 people were killed. Afternoon, the city is quiet. Army leaders, General Rawson and General Ramirez, appear before the populace gathered in Plaza de Mayo. 